Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 3.2. Uh, continuing on with this, this sort of intro to animal diversity chapter before we get into to specific groups of, uh, of animals. And what we're doing here is talking about the history of the entire planet uh, as it pertains to living things. And uh, man, these, these figures make it look a lot well, I, I almost said a lot more complicated than it actually is, but no, it really is this complicated. This is making it uh, more complicated than I am going to put it. So we're not going to be memorizing, you know, millions of years ago time periods and all the aeons, eras, periods, and epics and, and stuff like that. This is kind of just to show you just how much is going on here. What I'm going to do is try to provide a, a summary, just hitting the, the high points of things. But yeah, there's definitely a lot more to this. I'm really just, just scraping the surface here. So this begins uh, in the Precambrian period uh, in something called the Ediacaran period with the emergence of what's called the Ediacaran biota. Uh, the, this, is, this is where we see in the fossil record the first evidence of robust animal diversity. Lots and lots of different animals, different shapes and sizes. Uh, and these these things are weird, right? I mean, this, this looks more like a plant than an animal, and, and, and who knows what this thing looks like. Uh, here's another um, you know, artist's rendition based on the fossils we have trying to guess what these things could have looked like. And uh, Again, I'm bringing this up because these are so weird, and it illustrates a point that uh, as we go through this, a lot of the animals we're going to see have descendants that are alive today, and you can sort of see, oh yeah, that, that kind of looks like a, a bird that we see today, something like that. Uh, but what's cool or interesting about these Ediacaran biota is that they have no surviving members or descendants. They're sort of just a, a dead end evolutionarily, and that definitely can happen in uh, in evolutionary history. So my summary of this, uh, Ediacaran period, where we have the first evidence of robust animal diversity. Uh, all this stuff is marine, so we're, I'll, I'll let you know when we make it to the land, but right now all animal life is just in, in the oceans. And yeah, no, no surviving members or descendants of these really weird, just, just alien-looking animals. So this is this is where things you know started to get going, but things really start getting big in the Cambrian period. Uh, so this time period is sometimes called the Cambrian explosion. We have a, a huge. Uh, diversity of different animals uh, occupying a lot of different ecological niches. So instead of just you know being mostly uh, sessile and not very uh, dynamic here, we have large dynamic predators here, the Anomalocaris and the uh, Opabinia, weird looking, they still look kind of alien, uh, but these things do look you know more more familiar than, than some of the stuff before. These looks kind of like these look kind of like insects. These these trilobites. So uh, none of this stuff is alive today. But unlike the Ediacaran biota, they have left uh, descendants. So uh, what we see emerging here is the ancestors to modern invertebrates. And again, we're all still in the ocean. Um, my summary of this, so Cambrian period here, next highlight, Cambrian explosion, a rapid, geologically speaking, rapid uh, diversification of animals, all invertebrates, we haven't gotten vertebrates yet, uh, all marine, as I said, no surviving members, but we see the emergence of the ancestors to most modern groups of invertebrates in this time period. Now, a good question might be why like what what led to this why why did all of these new species emerge around this time period and there are a couple of explanations so this explosion might have occurred uh, due to increased atmospheric o2 i mean we're animals we're heterotrophs we do cellular respiration we need o2 more more o2 in the atmosphere that's it's going to fuel the power uh, of life of, of animal life uh, a protective ozone layer sort of goes along with this it's easier to survive especially in shallow water if you've got an ozone layer and or increased calcium in the ocean due to geological activity so a lot of these uh, a lot of these animals have shells uh, made of calcium or that incorporate calcium, extra calcium in the ocean, you know, would allow them to survive and reproduce better. 
So the rest of the Paleozoic era, just to get really skimming over a lot of stuff here, uh, did see the evolution of land plants. So here's our next big thing. Plants took to the land before uh, before animals did. And, you know, I discussed this in our plants chapter when we talked about these early land plants. Uh, you know, more sunlight out here, fewer predators, at least at first. And so, yeah, land plants uh, throughout the rest of the Paleozoic era. Uh, we, after that, you know, still within this Paleozoic era, because again, I'm not breaking this down as, as fine as, you know, one could, uh, after land plants, we do see land animals. Now that there's food available on land, that's an incentive for animals, at first invertebrates, to colonize the land. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the ancestors of, uh, of modern spiders and, and centipedes were sort of first here. Um, we also see uh, marine vertebrates. So the first uh, fish, uh, basically, you know, weird looking shapes here, but these are you know, aquatic vertebrates within this uh, Paleozoic era. And then eventually, you can probably guess what's coming next, land vertebrates. And so uh, in, in this period, uh, near the end of the Paleozoic, the Permian period, we see land vertebrates that, that look like this. Um, and these are kind of weird looking. I mean, I, I guess uh, these the Dimetrodon is is something that uh, a lot of people are probably somewhat familiar with. This, but this most chops and all, all this other stuff. Um, uh, <laughs> these are not these are not dinosaurs. Uh, despite and you know, despite some of them superficially looking like dinosaurs, uh, most of these are what you would call proto mammals. Uh, we'll get into this uh, when we when we talk about mammals, uh, but these are actually a, a group of vertebrates that's more closely related to us than they are to reptiles. So I know that the Dimetrodon uh, is you know sometimes shown alongside dinosaurs or you know in a book about dinosaurs or something like that for kids. It's not a dinosaur, even though it kind of looks like one. It's it's more closely related to a mammal than a dinosaur. And one of the reasons why these things are not as popular as dinosaurs, just in you know the common um, you know con public consciousness, uh, they're they're not as well understood because remember we're not two dinosaurs yet. This is an older time period. We have fewer fossils of these things, these these Permian land vertebrates, uh, and so yeah, they're they're just not as well known as the dinosaurs, uh, and. Obviously, these were not to last because we don't see any of this stuff alive today. Uh, at the end of the Permian period, we have an extinction event. Uh, not just an extinction event, but a really, really big extinction event. Uh, probably the biggest extinction event of animals uh, in the entire Earth's history. Um, this is, you know, uh, R.I.P. to all of this stuff. All these proto mammals, uh, you know, R.I.P. to uh, to these trilobites, which had been around for a very long time since the Cambrian explosion. They all went extinct during this period as well. Um, this so-called Permian Triassic extinction event uh, led to the extinction of many animal species. We're talking eighty one percent of marine species and 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species. So that's a that's a huge loss of all sorts of groups, including including insects, uh, which are you know pretty robust throughout their planet's history. But yeah, this is this is sometimes called the great the great dying uh, because yes, this was a, an, a, a huge extinction event. Um, yeah, vertebrate and invertebrate, aquatic and terrestrial, just, man, a lot of stuff wiped out. Uh, and, you know, there are questions as to why this happened. Um, potential causes include one or more meteor impacts, uh, massive volcanic eruptions, uh, you know, climate change brought out by release of underwater methane. Uh, yeah, again, these are all possible, or maybe all of these together, this extinction event, the causes of this are not as well understood, because again, this is a really long time ago, hard to, to try to track down, but we know that all this stuff disappears from the fossil record. Now, with all of this stuff gone, or you know, so many species gone, what that leaves is empty ecological niches. 
you know, these large predator or large herbivore niches, with, with these things gone, there's a there's a vacuum. And the survivors are gonna fill that vacuum. And you know who survived the Permian Triassic extinction event? The ancestors to dinosaurs and reptiles. So with the, the playing field wiped clear of all these, these proto-mammals and gorgonopsids and stuff like that, uh, reptiles diversified, exploded, occupied all these different niches, uh, land, land herbivores, uh, you know, large land carnivores, re you know, reptiles took to the skies, took to the oceans. Uh, this is in, in uh, now the Mesozoic era, dinosaurs and other reptiles uh, rose to dominance, you know, filling in these niches uh, that, were, that were left empty after that great dying Permian Triassic extinction event. And um, I say dinosaurs and reptiles, so I, I want to, you know, I hope I'm not being pedantic here, but, you know, these things, uh, like the Dimetrodon, sometimes like called dinosaurs, but no, these things are technically marine reptiles, and this is a, a flying reptile, the pterosaurs. Um, they lived alongside the dinosaurs, uh, and they were also reptiles, uh, but these are, these are not dinosaurs, but they were very successful flying uh, and marine reptiles at this point. Uh, so also in the Mesozoic era, so we saw, you know, dinosaurs and reptiles, you know, taken over the world. Uh, but we also saw within this era, birds and mammals. So at this point, mammals were mostly small, nocturnal, insectivorous, you know, not as dominant as dinosaurs were. And, and birds, very similarly, uh, you know, not you know, occupying these huge niches in the land, the air, and the sea. Both of these are just sort of in the background uh, near the end of this era, but they, they did evolve um, among the dinosaurs. But as we all know, this was, uh, this was not to last uh, for the, the reign of the dinosaurs here. We have another major extinction event, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. This one's a lot better understood uh, than the Permian Triassic extinction event. This was caused by a meteor impact, uh, the evidence of which is still seen in southeast Mexico. Uh, and this killed off all the non-avian dinosaurs, uh, all of these uh, successful flying reptiles, large marine reptiles, uh, ammonites, which were very common in the ocean, a type of invertebrate closely related to, uh, to the nautilus, uh, all this stuff was wiped out. So all the non-avian dinosaurs, uh, okay, uh, side note, uh, when, when we talk about birds and we look at some phylogenetic trees, birds evolved from a specific group of dinosaurs. And if you're talking about things in terms of clades, a clade is an ancestor in all its descendants. So technically birds are dinosaurs. Um, anyway, more on that later. But uh, when I say it, it wiped out all the, I can't say it wiped out all the dinosaurs because birds survived this extinction event, but all the non-avian dinosaurs were wiped out. Uh, those pterosaurs, those flying reptiles, the large marine reptiles and ammonites, all these things wiped out by the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. And, you know, the story repeats itself with the, the playing field wiped clear. Uh, so many ecological niches are now empty. Guess who comes in to scoop things up? Birds and mammals. So that leaves us uh, in, the, in the current era, the Cenozoic era, where we have you know large herbivore mammals and carnivore mammals in the in the ocean and you know birds in the sky. You know these things really took over after the dinosaurs uh, and you know all, all these other things from the Cretaceous period were wiped out. So. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here, and, and I only covered a couple of extinction events. Uh, there have been others. There's an end Triassic one, and a couple of other ones going back further here. That the pattern we see in the planet's history is, you know, a group becomes successful, or, or several groups become successful. You have an extinction event due to, you know, various causes. Uh, when the ecological niches are emptied out, new things will, uh, you know, radiate outwards because of evolution, selective pressure, fill those niches and become successful there. So here's the, here's the takeaway message from talking about these mass extinctions. Mass extinction events lead to empty ecological niches, which are filled by evolutionary radiation of the surviving groups. 
So that's how we have the, the world we have today, uh, the ancestors to all the, the successful birds and mammals we see in uh, terrestrial and aquatic environments. We're able to, to get to those places because of the extinction of the stuff that was in those niches beforehand. Okay. So again, hopefully this was, you know, just a, a quick uh, rundown of things because it definitely gets more complicated than the, than the way I put it. But I hope that that was an effective summary of history of life on the planet. So now we're ready to actually start talking about animals. And this textbook, like many textbooks, uh, is going to split animals up into two chapters, a chapter on invertebrates and a chapter on vertebrates. So let's get started now with invertebrates. So first off, let me just clarify some terminology here. Uh, when we're talking about animals in, in general, we're talking about members of Kingdom Animalia. So members of Kingdom Animalia are animals. And another name for animals is metazoans. So metazoa, animals, Kingdom an Animalia, that's all the same stuff. Okay, here is the phylogenetic tree for uh, metazoans, for animals. And man, this is looking big and complicated, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna simplify this just just a little bit. So um, I'm gonna get rid of these uh, these so-called tenophora comb jellies. They look a lot like sea jellies or jellyfish, you know, superficially. They're technically you know their own uh, their own group separated from uh, the rest of jellyfish, but it, it's a relatively small group. Bam, they're gone. Um, the Placozoa is another group that doesn't have uh, very many members. Uh, they can be confusing compared to other groups with similar names. They're microscopic marine planktonic animals. Uh, it's not clear where they fit in, but again, they're not very big uh, and they're not very understood, so bam, they're out of here. Um, next, let's get rid of Aceola. Uh, these are flatworms. There is another group also called flatworms, so uh, sorry, uh, Aceola, you're out of here. Uh, next, let's go to Ectoprocta and Brachiopoda. Um, they're, you know, pretty cool looking, but they're two relatively small groups that, especially in an intro course, in, in the, you know, the interest of time, getting rid of them. Uh, and as simplified as I've made this, I actually do want to add one group in. Nemertia, also known as ribbon worms. Trust me, when we get to them, they're, they're going to be worth adding in. So uh, hopefully this is where we're left now, and, and hopefully this is a bit simpler than it was when we started. It, it's still a lot of groups, but again, this is going to span several, several lecture periods. And yeah, this is, this is going to be our sort of roadmap to the next several lectures. So just like we did with plants, let's start simple and get more complicated. Uh, let's start down here in a group called Parazoa. So technically, Parazoa is a sub kingdom. So this is, uh, you know, domain, kingdom, phylum. We're not to the phylum level yet. This is underneath kingdom Animalia, sub kingdom Parazoa. Uh, members of sub kingdom Parazoa do not have tissues. Again, these are the simplest animals. That means they have so no cell layers. So that means, are they diploblasts or triploblasts? Neither. Na, not applicable. Are they acelomates or pseudocy? Na, not applicable. Are they protostomes or deuterostomes? Nope, neither of those things. So this is a, another sort of organizational chart thing. It, it seems like an immense amount of information, but you know, this is just to, to organize stuff. We're going to fill this out one thing at a time as we go through these different groups. Uh, our first group uh, within this subkingdom, Parazoa, is going to be Periphera, as we'll see in just a second. And man, it's dead simple to fill this one out. Uh, as I said, as, as Parazoans, uh, members of this group are <laughs> NA for all of this stuff. So that's that's an, an easy start to, to this information. So, okay, let, let's talk about uh, periphera. So now we are at the phylum level. This is, you know, the phylum periphera. It's the only phylum within this sub-kingdom of Parazoa. And periphera, uh, members of periphera are more commonly known as sponges. Uh, so they come in all different shapes and colors and sizes, but we're familiar with sponges, I hope. Uh, these are the oldest surviving 
group of animals and you know, we've brought them up before and you know how simple they are and their evolutionary relationship to these colonial protists um sponges lack body symmetry so i guess these are going to be the exceptions to a lot of stuff i set up in the last chapter so they they are the you know example of having no symmetry at all uh many of these are irregular cylinders with a with a central cavity so this is going to be they come in all shapes and sizes but this is going to be a common thing there's a central hollow cavity in here with one or more mouth-like openings but again no symmetry to the overall body now, despite the you know sort of disorganization that you might infer from its you know, lack of symmetry, many sponges uh, ha have a have a lot of specialized cell types. So here we're going to zoom in on things a bit. Here's your generic looking sponge with the central cavity and the opening at the top, and yeah, there are a lot of different cells uh, going on here that do a lot of different things. So. Members, uh, these are members of uh, subkingdom Parazoa. That means they don't have tissues. They don't have groups of cells that work together, but they definitely do have cells with specialized function. So just try to make a point of that. They don't have tissues, but they definitely have specialized cells. So, you know, whether it's uh, you know, cells that are involved in structural integrity or delivering nutrients or, you know, sexual reproduction or, or all, all these other things. Lots of different cell types in sponges. So let's look at this. Let's look at the life cycle real quick. So uh, the life cycle begins when an adult sponge releases sperm cells with flagella. Uh, these are going to you know, travel through the water column doing a little bit of swimming uh, until they find another sponge. As a side note, most sponges are hermaphroditic, uh, so they have they can make eggs and sperm. From a, a genetics evolutionary standpoint, it's usually best to not fertilize your own eggs. You want to spread your genetic information around a bit. So despite being hermaphroditic, uh, a lot of sponges have um, a sort of cycle where they'll go through a cycle where they make sperm but not eggs and then switch and make eggs but not sperm to avoid fertilizing themselves. But anyway, uh, sperm gets to egg, you have you know, fertilization, the formation of a zygote, all that cell division. Uh, the larvae is released into the water uh, and it you know, kind of swims around uh, a little bit. It has flagella. This kind of shows it. Sorry, this is the best figure I could show from, you know, this is when scientists get to draw things. They're, they're not always the best, but this is probably better than what I could draw. I just want to show that the, the flagella coming off of this sponge uh, larva uh, to show that these things, unlike the adult form, which just is anchored somewhere and doesn't move, at a certain point in their life cycle, they do swim around a bit until they anchor themselves and in, in, into a uh, into the ground, uh, grow more, and become sessile filter feeders. So, okay, what's my summary of this? Uh, sponge life cycle. Adult releases sperm, sperm gets to another sponge and fertilizes its egg. Again, hermaphroditic, uh, if you needed a key terms definition for this, hermaphroditic refers to an animal where both male and female gonads are present in the same individual. Uh, a larva develops, larva released, it has flagella, it is motile, the larva settles down, grows into adult, it is sessile, and a filter feeder. Okay, so uh, I believe this is the first time I've used this term, although I'm going to use it a lot in this and next chapter. A filter feeder is defined in the key terms as an animal that feeds by straining suspended matter and food particles from the water. So just, yeah, we're going to see a lot of different animals that have this, this basic lifestyle of getting their food by straining it from the water. Now, how do, they, how do they do this? Well, the way they strain stuff from the water is definitely not passive. Uh, th these sponges don't look like they're doing anything just by, you know, staring at them. Uh, but a lot is going on if you look more closely. Inside of the sponge body are these coanocyte cells, uh, these collared cells with flagella. And even though a flagellum is small, by having many, 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 many of these, uh, all beating their flagella back and forth, this creates a water current. It's going to pull water in from the outside through these pores called ostia and inside of this central cavity called the spongocele. This is not a coelom. This is not a pseudocelum. It's just 
seal means cavity and so that's why we see this as part of the term but this is not a coelom in any way it's just a different type of cavity anyway uh, where particles and stuff are, are sent into this sponge seal cavity and then out through this uh, this osculum this sort of mouth at the top here so as this water flows through that's how these uh, coanocytes are able to capture food particles so again just looking at a sponge under the water it, it's not moving it doesn't look like it's doing much but on a microscopic level there's a lot of movement going on in, in these uh, cells. There's a lot of water movement going on to, to do a really great job of filtering the water around them. So here's my summary of that, sponge feeding. Uh, these coenocyte cells use flagella to create water current through the pores in the body called the ostea. Uh, these cells also capture food particles from the water. Uh, the water enters this central chamber, the sponge seal, and is propelled through a large opening out of the sponge uh, called the osculum. Now, uh, let's talk about structure a little bit. We're going to talk about skeletons in, in most of the, the things that uh, most of the animals that we go through in this and the next chapter. Uh, the sponge body, and you know, some of these can grow to be kind of tall, has to have some sort of structural support. Uh, and they're going to get this through uh, a network of protein called very creatively, a protein called spongin uh, and or uh, these, these spicules uh, made of silica or calcium carbonate. Uh, so some sponges just have this spongin, they're the soft ones that you would you know, wash yourself with, uh, but some of them have spongin as well as these spicules, which you definitely would not want to rub this on your body, uh, but, but it gives them uh, an extra layer of structural support and uh, discourages things from eating them. So the sponge body is supported by proteins and or spikes of silica slash calcium carbonate secreted by specialized cells. So yeah, more of these specialized cells here that are involved in, in building this uh, quote unquote skeleton. So let's talk about reproduction a bit. I mean, we saw in the, the life cycle, the sexual reproduction, you know, sperm plus egg, all that fun stuff. Sponges are also capable of asexual reproduction in a couple of different ways. Uh, some of them can just bud off another fragment, which can detach and, and then attach to the ground and then just be another individual. It's a clone of the parent. Or they can uh, reproduce asexually through fragmentation, where, you know, maybe an attack by a predator or, you know, a, a storm or something like that. Some fragments can be torn from the adult body. They can float off, attach themselves, and develop into a new individual. So either, either of these things will work. Sponges can reproduce asexually by budding or by fragmentation. Okay, so that was a lot on sponges, but that's all I have for them. Let's let's move along here. So we're done with periphera, uh, and we're we're done with this parazoa. So the the subkingdom parazoa, no tissues. The only member there was periphera. So everything else, you know, all of this stuff, every other group that we talk about, is going to fall under the umbrella of eumetazoa. This is another subkingdom, members of subkingdom eumetazoa actually have tissues. They have groups of cells that work together. And you know, like we saw visually, this subkingdom is going to include all further groups. So, okay, which one of these further groups are we gonna hit up next? Well, uh, let's start down here with a group called Cnidaria. So members of phylum Cnidaria are called Cnidarians, uh, and they include uh, sea jellies, also known as jellyfish. Um, <laughs> there's uh, an, an interesting movement in the marine biology world to not call these things jellyfish anymore, which I, I get. They're they're not fish. Like why should they? They're they're very very distantly related from from actual fish. Uh, why do they have fish in the name? And so uh, they're trying to be rebranded as sea jellies instead of jellyfish. Uh, the same thing is true for um, starfish and sea stars. But anyway, however you want it, sea jellies, also known as jellyfish corals, stony or soft, and sea anemones. Uh, these are all uh, what we call cnidarians. So what can we say about cnidarians? Well, 
These are examples of what we, we defined in the last sort of intro to animals chapter, diploblastic. So that means you have an ectoderm, an endoderm, and then a non-living layer uh, in the middle. So that means uh, that means they are neither of these to go to this. Remember the coelomate and pseudocoelomate and acoelomate. This, these were subcategories of triploblastic animals. So they're diploblastic uh, and you know they, they don't have a body cavity. They're not acoelomates because you know this only applies to having three layers and no additional body cavity. Uh, so yeah, no body cavity. Uh, these are only found in triploblastic animals. Um, the non-living layer in between the endoderm and the ectoderm is a jelly-like mesoglea, uh, where they get the jellyfish or sea jellies get their name, uh, that's between the mesoderm, uh, or I'm sorry, between the ectoderm and the endoderm. So that helps us fill this table out a little bit diploblastic, Na for body cavity. Uh, oh, symmetry. They got radial symmetry. Again, here's a coral that was our, you know, poster child example for radial symmetry body plan. So members have radial symmetry uh, and no circulatory system. So we'll, we'll get to circulatory systems. There are going to be two major types. We'll get to that eventually, but this is still sort of an Na uh, for no circulatory system. Nidarians are not going to have um, complex body systems at all. So it's an, it's an NA uh, from circulatory system. Oh, and protostome or deuterostome, that's what I mean by the, the embryonic development. That's also an NA. This is something that's only going to apply once we get to triploblastic animals. So again, this, this table is going to seem very intimidating once it's all filled out, but we're doing it one group at a time, and a lot of this stuff is easy enough uh, to remember. Uh, a lot of the early ones are just going to be NA when we talk about these things. So, all right, what, what can we say about cnidarians? Well, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, these uh, they do have tissues, so they're an upgrade from you know the the parazoa, uh, but there are no advanced organs or organ systems. Um, they have what's called an incomplete digestive system. That means they are not tube-shaped animals with a mouth and an anus. There is really no mouth or anus. There's just a single opening to the gastrovascular cavity, and we can see this sort of cartoon of a, of a sea jelly, cartoon of an anemone. Uh, they're basically the same thing, just flipped upside down. You have a single opening, a gastrovascular cavity, and an exit. There's no tube, there's no mouth, there's no anus. Um, gas exchange, we're going to discuss this in several, most of the groups we talk about. Uh, there are no gills or lungs. Uh, gas exchange is just done directly from the cells to the surrounding water or the water within that gastrovascular cavity. So uh, by being, you know, relatively thin and having a thin, you know, skin, uh, they don't need lungs or a respiratory system or gills. They, they can just do gas exchange directly from the cells to uh, the gases that are in the surrounding water. Um, they do have nerve cells to, in a you know, coordinated fashion, grab something and bring it to the, the gastrovascular cavity to eat something, but there's no brain. Again, there's no co complex organ system, so there, there's definitely no brain uh, in cnidarians. Um, this mesoglea, which we've been seeing here, so this is the jelly-like substance in between the endoderm and the ectoderm, it performs the function of a digestive system and a circulatory system. Again, there is no organ system. There are no, no real organ systems here, but I mean, the function of a digestive system is to, you know, break stuff down and, and the, the function of a circulatory system is to move nutrients and gases around. This jelly does both of those jobs. You know, stuff breaks down here and, and because it, you know, runs the length of the entire body, it effectively moves things around even though it's not actually circulating the way a more complicated circulatory system would do. So the, the mesoglea, the jelly, uh, fulfills the function of these systems. Now, uh, as we've been seeing, there are two possible body plans here, uh, the medusa and the polyp. 
the polyp is sessile, uh, the medusa is motile, uh, and some cnidarians actually do both. So a lot of sea jellies are, you know, the medusa body plan, that's, you know, easy to see, uh, corals and stuff for the polyp body plan. Some cnidarians go back and forth. Uh, so some sea jellies will have a certain phase of their life where they have the medusa body plan, uh, but then, you know, uh, you go back to the polyp body plan and then convert to Medusa again. So that is called dimorphic. Not all of them do it. Some cnidarians are dimorphic. They alternate between the polyp and the Medusa just as a normal part of their life cycle. Now, uh, most, not all cnidarians are predators in one way or another, uh, and they use these unique specialized cells uh, called cnidocytes. A lot of silent seas here, but uh, these specialized cells called nidocytes uh, that are equipped with organelles called nematocysts. Uh, they have a, a touch-sensitive uh, thing sticking out. When they come into contact with something, that will cause the ejection of this barb and thread, often delivering paralyzing venom. Again, all of this is at the cell level. It's microscopic, uh, but you know, the, the venom is powerful enough to paralyze uh, this prey, bring it into their gastrovascular cavity, and, and then digest it. So uh, I'm saying most, because there are definitely exceptions, most cnidarians are predators using specialized cells called nidocytes with organelles called nematocysts uh, to deliver paralyzing toxins. So, okay, now uh, this, this phylum is robust enough to where we can look at specific groups within this phylum. And if you remember the, the first day of class, the domain kingdom phylum class, class is their next level of taxonomy. So uh, we're in phylum Nidaria. Let's talk about class Anthozoa. Uh, class Anthozoa includes sea anemones and corals. So these are uh, Anthozoans. They have uh, polyp bodies only, so none of these anthozoans uh, swim around in the medusa form. And uh, some interesting things about them, some have symbiotic relationships uh, with dinoflagellate algae. Hey, this might look familiar to you. When we talked about dinoflagellate algae, I used this exact slide, but here it is again. So uh, the, now we're talking about the, the coral or the anthozoan, you know, half of this thing, uh, you know, providing a safe space for these, uh, these protist dinoflagellate algae and the, the dinoflagellates, you know, performing photosynthesis and uh, giving uh, sugars, photosynthesis products to their uh, protector slash captor. Don't worry about it. Uh, so some have a symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellate algae, and this is vital in the formation of coral reef ecosystems. So uh, this is not just a member of the coral reef, but it's a vital foundational part of the coral reef ecosystem. Uh, if the coral dies, uh, and it's it, a lot of coral species are exquisitely sensitive to changes in ocean temperature or pH or pollutants. Uh, if the coral dies, it bleaches, it turns white, and man, most of the fish go with it. Most of the other uh, marine invertebrates and vertebrates and mollusks and all the other stuff goes with it. This is this is a bleached or dead coral reef. Uh, so coral is, is not just you know, part of the ecosystem, it, it is the ecosystem in, in many ways. Uh, and so, yeah, these are anthozoans, uh, vital in the formation of coral reef ecosystems. All right, so th that's all I got for, for the class thing. And when we get to the class level, usually I, I don't have much that I, that I want to say about members of a class, because we got to keep moving on. So uh, the next class I want to bring up is class uh, Scyphozoa. These are jellyfish, aka sea jellies. And we kind of discussed these already. You know, here's a, a sea jelly uh, that, you know, we typically think of them as uh, having the Medusa body plan. But as I just said, some of them go back and forth and are dimorphic. Um, I don't have anything else to say about Scyphozoa. You should just associate Scyphozoa with, with sea jellies. They can have the Medusa or, or be dimorphic. Um, I have two more classes uh, to talk about, but uh, as awkward as this is, this is typically where I run out of time in the in-person lecture. So it's, a, it's an awkward cutoff, but yeah, it, it is what it is. Uh, we'll finish up the last two classes of Nidaria and continue on with invertebrates in the next recorded lecture.